Hey, everybody. Uh, as I record this, it's Friday, August 27th, 2021. Today's podcast is a conversation with uh, Ben Rhodes, who is Deputy National Security Advisor for President Obama. And we talk about Afghanistan, of course, our 20-year war on terror where we took our eye off the ball in our in our foreign policy and ignored things like climate and China and democracy, all to our and to the world's detriment. Uh, then yesterday, the terrorist attack at the Kabul airport, uh, leaving a lot of people dead, including 13 American servicemen. Um, sometimes I say this podcast is like the daily without the resources of the New York Times. And that's, that's a joke. It's just me and Peter. And we have the very talented Rosilia Engineering in New York with us today here. So we recorded with Ben Rose on Wednesday before the attack. Ben warns about the possibility of that attack in our conversation. This is, is just another very sad day in this war, a very tragic exit. Ben and I discuss the various miscalculations, uh, intelligence failures that led uh, to the chaos we've seen in, in Kabul. I, of course, was a U.S. senator from 2009 to 2018. In 2009, as we were ramping up the surge in Afghanistan, I went with Michigan Senator Carl Levin. Carl, who was a great senator uh, and, and died just a couple weeks ago, uh, was at the time the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, we spent a couple days there, stayed at the embassy, met with the ambassador, Met with General McChrystal, the commander at the time, uh, with the general in charge of training the Afghan troops. Uh, met with a few members of, of the Afghan parliament. Basically, it was a dog and, and pony show. The, the only valuable information I, I got really uh, came from a member of the parliament. We had dinner at the embassy. And he told me that Afghanistan was tribal and that you were only held in esteem if you were corrupt on behalf of your tribe. You took care of your own. That's what made a good man, was someone who was loyal to his tribe and took care of them. To this day, that's the one piece of information I got as a senator that has helped me make sense of how doomed the idea of nation building was there from, from the beginning. Uh, a few months ago, I had Bill Crystal, the neocon, who um, whose views about a, a number of things have changed when Trump became the nominee. But Biden's decision to withdraw was questioned by Bill in our our discussion, and I, I told him that as senator, part of your job is making condolence calls uh, to parents and and to spouses who who asked, "What did my son die for?" What did my wife die for? And I said that, and I remember Bill said, yeah. Those are very hard calls to make, and the president is making them today, I, I'm sure. But getting out of there was the right thing to do. In the conversation you're about to listen to, we don't come up with very good answers for those who lost a loved one there. And again, this is Ben Rose, former Deputy National Security Advisor for President Obama. We discuss uh, what got us to this day and what our foreign policy reset should look like. I, I hope you'll find it helpful. Uh, I'd like to do sort of uh, the present, uh, the past, and the future, yeah. which I think covers everything. <laughs> So the present. Uh, now we're we're recording this on uh, Wednesday. This drops on a Sunday. So uh, when I say the present, it'll be a few days ago. But uh, where are we today in Afghanistan? Let's let's start there. Well, I think where we are today is the collapse of the Afghan government and security forces and you know, essentially Taliban takeover of the country immediately put at risk uh, not just thousands of Americans, but, you know, tens and tens of thousands of Afghans who worked with the United States military, worked with the United States government, took USAID funding to set up human rights organizations. And the evacuations that we're seeing at Kabul airport are essentially, you know, sand is running through the hourglass and 
and every life that we can save by getting people out uh, is is precious. And these people, if left behind, um, really could be at risk of Taliban reprisal of violence. At the same time, you have a chaotic scene at the airport where people have trouble getting in, where the Taliban is kind of controlling the flow of people, where they're, according to the administration, terrorist threats from potential ISIS affiliates. So it's an incredibly mm-hmm. fraught and complicated situation. Uh, but the question is just how many lives can we save before the U.S. pulls out? And, and uh, President Biden seems intent on that being August 31st. Right. And that was the deadline, or that's what he he said, that's when we'd be out by. And the Taliban is holding him to it. Let me ask you just how much of miscalculation uh, was there in terms of uh, getting in this situation where this is a not a pretty scene yeah people getting trying to get out and was it uh, bad intelligence was it uh why did we not understand that once we said we're leaving and we're leaving august 31st why would regional governors uh why would their troops not just surrender <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. Well, how did they not know this would happen and who, who's doing the intelligence? Well, I guess, you know, the first thing I'd say, just to the Taliban point at the very beginning, you know, they didn't keep their end of the deal. <laughs> they weren't supposed to militarily take over the country uh, under the deal that Trump negotiated with them for withdrawal. So it, it's... Surprise. And, yeah. And Biden already pushed back Trump's deadline. Trump's deadline to get everybody out was actually earlier this year. So yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know that we should feel obligated to a deal that nobody's really kept. Um, in terms of what happened, it's a failure that you know spreads across the last two administrations, and, and we'll get to the previous ones, <laughs> including the one I served in the, in the past, so I'm not absolving uh, Obama or obviously Bush. But you know, uh, I think what happened here is that Trump cut a deal with the Taliban that cut the Afghan government completely out of those negotiations. So you know, think yep. of the United States negotiating with the Taliban adversary, but not with the legitimate Afghan government as part of that. The U.S. said, essentially, if you don't shoot at us, um, Taliban will leave. And I think what ended up happening is every Afghan regional, you know, commander or governor of, of sorts kind of probably cut a version of the same deal, you know, that they see the writing on the wall, the U.S. is leaving. Why would you fight them? Why would you yes. risk getting, well, first of all, getting killed yourself, but your family being killed? I mean, why not just go, hey, I'm now Taliban? <laughs> well, exactly. And think about it this way, Al. Like, so first of all, the Afghan security forces were entirely dependent on the U.S. and U.S. kind of contractors for their army to work. You know, that was how they got intelligence. That's how they, you know, maintained their helicopters. That's how they they operated. And so once we pulled out, they couldn't operate in the same way that they did when we were essentially serving as the backstop. So they already know that they're in a weaker position relative to the Taliban than they even were before, and they weren't winning before. Then they know that, as you said, if they fight, you know, outside of Kandahar or something and lose, not only are they going to be killed, but, you know, perhaps their family is going to be subject to reprisals. And then they see even the rosier assessments out of the United States where, well, the government should be able to hang on for 18 months and then lose. Yeah. And so why would you fight if you know you're going to lose? You can't fight in the same way that you did with the U.S. support and your family's at risk. So I think when Biden decided, you know, a decision that I think a lot of people, myself included, uh, sympathize with to say, like, you know, we need to get out. Sure. I think what the, the mistake was to just not anticipate the worst case scenario as the most likely scenario, because and I've been in government, Alan, like you've been you, you've been in the Senate, you've gotten these briefings like you see, you know, on a piece of paper, there are 300,000 Afghan security forces. They have this equipment. And and, you know, that's what Biden was citing earlier in the summer. But but those are numbers on a piece of paper, you know, that, that that doesn't tell you about the motivation of an Afghan soldier, you know, outside of Kandahar. And and so I think the, the, the window of time between when he announced withdrawal and the fall of Kabul wasn't maximized to do the kinds of evacuations we're seeing now, which led to a much more kind of chaotic circumstance in the last few days. OK, I'm I'm sorry, but all of this was very foreseeable. Yeah. You said I was in the Senate. I was there for the uh, when they did the surge in '09, yeah, yeah. and I went to Afghanistan with uh, uh, Senator Levin, who was chairman of the uh, Armed Services Committee at the time. And I got you know a dog and pony show, and yeah. 
I stayed in the embassy. I talked. I went talked to Karzai. I met with him. I spent a lot of time with McChrystal. Uh, talked to the general who was training the Afghan troops. Everything they said didn't happen, and it's been apparent for a long time. I just think this was the logical. If you just thought this through, what's wrong with our intelligence people? What, what's wrong? I mean, you're deputy national security advisor. What went on here? How did this? which I'm sorry, just completely foreseeable. And that's easy to say in hindsight, but boy, oh boy, of course they're not going to fight. Yeah. And so how did this happen? You know, here's what I'd say, you know, when I was in government, and I think this, you know, more than likely than not projects forward, the intelligence community was actually usually the most realistic slash negative about the circumstances in Afghanistan, and the military was usually the most optimistic about what was happening in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that a part, a big part of that. What about military intelligence? Well, here's the thing: the, that all runs through. <laughs> yeah, no, it's right, but it all runs you know? through ISAF, right? The, the the military command in Afghanistan. And I think what happens, it's kind of human nature in a way. They want to put the best you know, appearance on their work. And they want to believe that what they're doing is making progress. And they want to, you know, validate the fact. Okay, that but that's training. not your job to make yourself feel good. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I'm I don't think. You, is it? Yeah. Is it? I mean, you were, you were a deputy national security advisor. Yeah. Is that, was that part of the description? No, no. And, you know, but, and look, we, <laughs> you know, no secret. I, I, I mean, uh, I'm, I, I was skeptical um, about a lot of, of the underlying assumptions of the surge and our military effort in Afghanistan. But uh, again, when you build this kind of enormous machinery of war and state building in a di- different country, um, I think it's hard for people to kind of acknowledge to themselves that it's a house of cards that's going to collapse when we leave, you know? So, you know, yes, there was... Boy, yeah. oh boy, I would think that... You want intelligence people who are realistic, and you want military people who are realistic. Yeah. And you don't want people going like, oh, boy, I'm going to feel a lot better if I feel like we're really accomplishing something. I mean, there's the consequences. We're seeing the consequences now. We've also been there for 20 friggin' years, and how many American deaths and Afghan deaths. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, oh boy! Uh, yeah, I, I, listen. We, ha- I agree with Biden that we have to leave. I don't understand how you can't leave some kind of counterterrorism force, but maybe I don't understand that, and may- maybe that's a counterterrorism force in, like Qatar or something like that. I mean, obviously, the reason we went in there was to prevent another attack from Afghanistan, from from you know, letting them be a safe haven for Al Qaeda. And 20 years later, uh, we haven't really accomplished much other than for now, it isn't a safe haven for Al Qaeda, but you mentioned ISIS, a ISIS group that's there now. In a strange way, it's useful to think of Afghanistan as having kind of two wars. One was the war against Al Qaeda to basically just take out that network. And then the other is the, the nation building effort, which we've just seen collapse. And you know, actually, I think the U.S. military, you know, basically, Al, if you and I were talking after 9-11, I think we would have assumed that the reason to go into Afghanistan was to take out al-Qaeda. And they accomplished that mission. Mm-hmm. And, and frankly, like a lot of that was accomplished at the height of the surge when we had a lot of capacity there. A lot of that activity obviously was in Pakistan, including the effort to get Osama bin Laden. Um, but, you, you know, you don't have that, that network has been basically destroyed and um, you, you don't have a, an Al Qaeda safe haven in partnership with Al, uh, with the Taliban in the same way you did before 9/11. I think you know the the challenge that emerges uh, when you have the Taliban taking over is you know less that they're allied with ISIS they're not. It's that you know this whole country has been a war zone for years. Um, all manner of armed people, um, including some of whom are Islamic extremists, are, are there. And so, it, it, you know, it's the kind of place where ISIS can try to recruit and establish a, a something of a foothold. In, in terms of our having a base, I, I think what Biden calculates is, look, you know, we, we don't have bases in a lot of countries where 
we've taken action against terrorist networks, whether that's Pakistan or uh, Yemen or, 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 or different places. We can do things with air power. We can do things with special operations that don't require a base. I think when I was in... Gun- I don't know if Yemen is a big success story. It's not. No, I'm not. Well, but that's a... That's the same. The same thing is present in Yemen as in Afghanistan. There's, there's two. There's the war against Al Qaeda, and then there's this, you know, terrible uh, Saudi-led war against uh, the Houthis. It's basically a civil war. But I, I do want to just come back real quick to the base question in Afghanistan because we looked at this at the end of the Obama years, and the question is: Bagram Air Base was our biggest base in Afghanistan. You probably visited there sure. several times. Yeah. Yeah. Why not just keep Bagram as a counterterrorism base? And I think that the the analysis usually is that in order to have a base like that, you need to have enough pr- troops there to protect the base. You know, there's a certain number of troops there are counterterrorism, then there's a certain number of troops who are there to protect that force. And that, you know, you, you kind of get it. And then the question becomes, well, if you have that base, do you use it to protect our embassy in Kabul? And, and very quickly, you know, the mission creeps outward. Because if we had a base and you had a situation like we just saw with the Taliban moving to Kabul, do we take a few thousand American troops to try to prevent that? So I think you know the choice Biden made, from what I can see, is, look, there may be a counterterrorism challenge in Afghanistan, but we don't need to have troops stationed on the ground in Afghanistan to be able to deal with that. And what do you do? Do you, you have uh, satellites and flyover? I mean, how, how do you monitor whether or not there's like terrorism training like al-Qaeda did? And I don't know if it would be the ISIS people but i mean how how do you how do you make sure that 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 we're not attacked from there again well it's difficult obviously more difficult without us being there i i you know without I, um, this isn't revealing anything but i mean i think you know you you have uh, an intelligence network and, and frankly the united states has obviously interacted with a lot of people in afghanistan you know i think that you have a combination of human intelligence that tries to get information about any potential terrorist activity or safe havens and then you have your other intelligence mechanisms to, yeah, like you said, from kind of overhead imagery, but to, you know, just trying to get inside of how an ISIS or an Al-Qaeda is communicating around uh, amongst its operatives. And, and you just, you know, it's just an intelligence challenge. And look, this is the whole point of what is so you know interesting about coming up to the, the two decade anniversary of 9-11 is that there was a world in which we tried to deal with terrorism that way, where... We used military force in a kind of targeted way at terrorists when we became aware of a safe haven and, and, and didn't necessarily invade and occupy and try to nation build in distant countries. We seem to be reverting back to a kind of more recognizable form of counterterrorism that doesn't involve those kinds of military deployments. Um, and it you know, calls into question in my mind why and whether it was necessary. Why we did to, what we did? But, yeah, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Never mind, you know, Yemen or Somalia or, or other countries. Well, Iraq that. was, uh, you know, we were lied yeah. into that. So there's that. There's that. There's that. Yeah. There's that. Uh, that. That small, small piece of that. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the past. It just seems that after 9-11, uh, we just shifted our entire foreign policy to counterterrorism. Yeah. And then I want to ask you about the future, which is what kind of reset are we going to do? Yep. But uh, I think a lot of bad things happen from our overriding focus on that. I mean, yep. we haven't been hit. So that's good. Yep. Yep. Uh, but we've taken the eye off the ball on a lot of things. Uh, just democracy, I'd say. Uh, on China, I'd say. Yep. Um, on the pandemic, I'd say. Yep. So where did we screw up? And I, I think, I think part of it was Iraq, and part of it is uh, the staying in Afghanistan for twenty years and fooling ourselves. I guess, I guess that's what we did. Yeah, I mean, I think. Look, what you had when I look back on this is, you know, between nine eleven and the invasion of Iraq, there are a number of extraordinary, extraordinarily important decisions made. You know, we decided to go in Afghanistan. We decide not just to go in, but to to nation build, to stick around. Not, you know, we could have just gone in, taken out Al Qaeda, and left. Then, once having decided to nation build in Afghanistan, we decide to invade and occupy Iraq, which has nothing to do with nine eleven, and which severely undercut kind of the credibility of of everything we were doing in the world. Meanwhile, in those same years, though, we're we're setting up Gitmo, we're we're engaging in torture, 
we're passing you know uh, laws that grant sweeping powers to the government. And we're also rebuilding the government now. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security is established. ICE is established. Sure. The National Counterterrorism Center. The, the machinery of the United States government is kind of reconstructed to fight this kind of open-ended war that Bush then compares you know, to the Cold War or to the effort in World War II, even though we're talking about a few thousand terrorists in a handful of countries on the other side of the world. And if you look at the 20-year period since, there, there, there are evident costs. You know, the price tag is nearly $7 trillion. We've lost thousands of Americans, hundreds of thousands of Afghans and Iraqis, tens of millions of people have been displaced. Um, you have the positive of, of no mass casualty attacks, but there's a huge cost that's gone along with that. And the places where we fought these wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, are not better off. Libya. From, yeah, Libya. Absolutely. Libya are not better off from a humanitarian perspective than they were uh, when we went in. But I think it's also worth considering, because this, I think, foreshadows to some extent where we go, what did we not do during those seven years? We did not deal with climate change. What if some of that $7 trillion had been repurposed as that, or some of our foreign policy had been more focused on that? Um, we did not deal mm-hmm. with the recession of democracy in this country and around the world, some of which I think was tied to the war on terror. Because when you say you're invading and occupying Iraq to spread democracy, I think that that frankly, undermined our capacity to spread democracy uh, or promote democracy around the world. Also, we undermined our democracy by, one, torturing people, but, yeah. but also spying on people. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, on Americans. Yeah, I, I, you know, for this book I wrote recently, I talked to some people in places like Hong Kong, and, and they told me, look, you know, when we saw the Patriot Act passed um, after 9-11, we thought, well, you know, the Americans just gave the the Chinese Communist Party a, a giant gift here in in kind of legitimizing a certain degree of government in, in, in authority and power, which obviously the Chinese Communist Party takes to a greater extreme. Um, but you know, we have to think about you know we're the most powerful nation in the world. What is the example that we started to set after nine eleven in terms of how we looked at the world, and, and why would we be surprised that other nations from Russia to China and others might take that to extremes. Um, so I, I, I think when we, any honest appraisal of the 20 year effort that we're approaching here since 9-11, I, I hope would at a minimum absorb the lesson that nation building wars in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, we were supposed to have learned from Vietnam that that's not the proper use of the US military. And it has tremendous unintended consequences. But that also terrorism is not the overriding interest of the United States of America. I mean, terrorism is a problem that has to be dealt with, but relative to climate change or inequality or the relative rise of China or uh, the retreat of democracy in the world, that terrorism is not in, in the same category, frankly, of interest. It, it, it's something you have to do to defend Americans, but doesn't, that doesn't require everything that we've been doing since 9-11. This means we, we have a reset I mean, I think Biden's trying to do that. I think, you know, he's saying, if you listen to everything he said since he took office, clearly the agenda he wants to focus on internationally is China and climate change and democracy. And I think part of what informed his Afghanistan decision is like, look, in order to kind of refocus on that, because I think people need to realize it's not just the wars itself. It's what are we talking to other countries about? Like when I remember when Obama came into office in 2009, there are all the things you want to do. But frankly, the first topic in every bilateral conversation with the European country was still Afghanistan because they're fighting a war with us there. And, and so I think what Biden's thinking is like, we need to kind of recalibrate our foreign policy, but also what, what are we trying to do with other countries? What are we spending money on? You know, who, what kind of experts are we hiring into the government? And, and how does that shift from this 20 year focus on terrorism to this bigger agenda? This is only a part of it, though. I mean, I think, you know, we have a, a huge infrastructure of counterterrorism that is bigger than it needs to be. That spans different countries. You mentioned Yemen, like we, you know, should we not be providing any support for the war there? Um, but then, you know, in addition to, to that, I think there's a legal question that brings in Congress, which is that we've been at war in multiple countries for 20 years under a single congressional authorization mm-hmm. that was passed in 2001, 20 years ago. And I think that needs to be repealed, and there needs to be a much more narrowly tailored, time limited kind of authorization for these. There, there's been board. many attempts to do that, and we've always failed. Yeah, I mean, when we try, so we tried in the Obama, you'll remember, in the Obama years to, to get a different authorization to deal with ISIS, 
and we wanted to kind of establish a precedent that, hey, we don't want to, uh, we're, we're not going to ask for a blank check. So we asked for a, a, a time limit on how, how long the authorization was. I think three years is what we we're aiming at. And then we asked for specificity around the number of countries that we could engage in military action. So there wasn't what we've seen with the 2001, where you can use it basically anywhere. And, and interestingly, Republicans didn't want to, to, to limit Obama. It's, only, it's the only thing now in eight years where they're like, no, no, we don't want to constrain the president in his capacity to wage open-ended war. Like, you know, these are people that spend every other waking minute figuring out how to tie Obama's hands. They thought we were unduly trying to tie our own hands in that case. Uh, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I, we kept bringing this up. To, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to get yeah, rid- yeah. Uh, and uh, geez, I, it's amazing that that it's still there. You know, I was bothered that we didn't sanction Saudi Arabia for Khashoggi's yeah. murder. You know, when when Biden didn't do that, it it made me think that this is sort of part and parcel of this, which is okay. We're keeping Saudis happy because we have to because they're the counter to Iran. And it seems like we have, we're not operating on principles that would, you know, uh, be a model for the rest of the world. Yeah. We're kind of all over the place. Well, this is another way, I think, in which this kind of huge enterprise of the war on terror uh, undermines other American interests. So our interest in democracy, and Biden's talked a lot about the existential kind of competition between democracy and autocracy. That is totally undermined by the fact that the U.S. has partners like Egypt and Saudi Arabia that are among the most repressive governments in the world. And everybody can see that and throw back in our face whenever we open our mouths about democracy. Well, why are you backing Mohammed bin Salman, who chops up a journalist in a third country, or Sisi, the dictator in Egypt, who's got tens of thousands of, of political prisoners? And look, I think part of, of moving out of this period is breaking that mindset that we're, we're so dependent on these people. I mean, you mentioned. Saudi Arabia and Iran, like Saudi Arabia doesn't need our encouragement to be to be uh, in an adversarial position vis-a-vis Iran like they already are. They frankly don't need to, to go after terrorist groups like ISIS as a favor to us because they too are threatened by them, you know? And so there's this kind of weird asymmetry in, in how even though we're the superpower, there's, and, and this frustrated me, you know, in the Obama years, because I, you know, I could see the dysfunction in, say, the Saudi relationship that, like, and, and, you know, Obama didn't get along very well with those guys, certainly by the end, you'll remember. But this idea that, that we needed them, well, no, like, they, they need us a lot more than them. And if they're not willing to, to respect pretty basic human rights, we're not asking this to look like, you know, a, a liberal democracy in every sense. But, but if they're flagrantly violating human rights, we shouldn't be giving them billions of dollars of assistance in the case of Egypt, and we shouldn't be kind of looking away from the evidence that uh, implicates Mohammed bin Salman and, on the Khashoggi case. How much of the aid to Egypt is still sort of a reward for the Beg and Sadat <laughs> um, reset there? So it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at the military assistance to Egypt, uh, it's rooted in the Camp David Accords. But a lot of the things we give them, or, or you know, are counterterrorism related. Um, you know, we need helicopters to go after uh, extremists and you know things like that. But then, Al, another piece of this is the billions of dollars in assistance is actually, in many cases, billions of dollars in payments to American defense contractors who then mm-hmm. ship the weapons to Egypt. And so, part of the reason that you get some congressional resistance to stopping military aid or, you know, who knows, maybe you know, within the executive branches is, is also that. And so, uh, look, I think we have to recognize that we're in a totally different world from, you know, when the Camp David Accords were reached. It's been over 40 years. And again, Egypt has its own reasons to maintain relations with Israel going forward. And, and they're doing that. They have quite, you know, I think, robust relations with Israel under CC. We don't need to be subsidizing that anymore. And, and even from you know, an Israel perspective, I mean, you know, after the Abraham Accords, like that's the trend things are going in. The, the idea that, that, that the price of those relationships continuing is billions of dollars in U.S. military, I, I don't think that that's necessary at this point. Well, yeah, but it's billions to our arms. Exactly. And I think that, that gets under, so. under, under discussed when this comes up. 
Yeah, and uh, lobbyists uh, or former members of Congress. Yeah, or former members of administrations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, I think that's one of the reasons, you know, people say, well, how did Trump happen? I, I think Americans look at Washington and look at how self-serving it very often is and how, you know, if, if you go from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, and visit D.C. and you see the shining, I mean, not just the government buildings, but restaurants, hotels, and you're going like, man, oh, man, we don't have any of this in Wilkes Bar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these people are doing really well. And you see members of Congress leave to go lobby for, oh, yeah. like Norm Goldman went to lobby for Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, drain the swamp was, uh, you know, not the right plumber to call um, <laughs> in Trump, but uh, there was a reason that resonated, you know. One of the things I was felt acutely when I was in government is there was a coziness and a kind of revolving door nature to the fact that governments like Saudi Arabia uh, or the UAE, you know, would pour money into American think tanks that then turned out the papers that justified the policies that continued to support them or to engage in their proxy wars. And then people who leave government, you know, become on the boards of defense contractors who then profit from, you know, this is not, it's all hiding out in plain sight. And, you know, I saw a report out today that, you know, Eric Prince, the, the you know, guy who set up Blackwater and obviously has been the yeah. forefront of military uh, contracting, who's probably made God knows how much money in these post 9 11 wars is, you know, charging thousands of dollars per seat in planes, you know, running out of Afghanistan. It was kind of a perfect, you know, coda to this whole thing where a lot of people made a lot of money off. Really? Of these, you know? Yeah. 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 Wait a minute. He's auctioning off seats out of Afghanistan? Yeah, something like $5,000 a seat or something on charters that they're running, right? So, you know, and but again, the, these Holy are, crap. Yeah, this has been a very... Uh, he's DeVos's uh, brother, right? Is that right? Yes, he's Betsy DeVos's brother, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh. Okay, uh, let's talk about the reset, uh, the future, yeah. because hopefully... That's part of what the signals getting out of Afghanistan. What do we do going forward? What should we do going forward with our foreign policy? What are we going to do? Uh, and are they anywhere near uh, the same? First of all, if you were to just make an assessment about what is a threat to the American people and what is going to be the biggest threat to them for the next 10, 20, 30 years, you know, presumably you should make decisions about your foreign policy and your resources based on that. Climate change um, has to become much more central to our foreign policy. And when people hear that, they think, well, you know, is it climate change, we should just be, you know, transitioning our economy, investing in clean energy, uh, and maybe negotiating, you know, with other countries, uh, things like the Paris Agreement. But it goes beyond that, because in order to get the scale of action globally that you need, this has to become a, an issue in all your relationships. So if you're talking to Brazil, the priority in that relationship has to be, you know, don't burn down the Amazon. You know, um, if you're, you know, if you're talking to to China, it's not just what China's doing within China. It's the fact that they're building coal plants all along the the Belt Road Initiative of infrastructure that they're doing in a lot of countries, it, and and on and on and on. So I think deeply, you know, really embedding climate change in in how we interact with the world, so that we're positioned to deal with this issue for 10, 20, 30 years. You know, you're also going to have to manage huge migration flows from climate emergencies. Um, that jumps yep. out to me. And pandemic preparedness is a piece of this as well that needs more investment. I think the Biden team also looks you know, at China as um, you know, this is a, an enduring challenge where China is more assertive. They're going to be pushing into regions where the United States has had more influence in the past and, and that the U.S. kind of government and national security apparatus has to be kind of positioned to deal with this long-term series of challenges from China and the economy um, in Asia and other places. You know, I think that that is, frankly, necessary to a degree. I, I, I think you can over crank it and, and kind of create like a self-fulfilling Cold War 2.0 there. What, what are the challenges going forward from China, both uh, like militarily and economically? Um, and, and, and militarily in terms of technology and, you know, how, how much is uh, cyber terrorism <laughs> now a big part of what is a threat? 
Yeah, I think technology, and because technology is be my third big one. And I think if you look at the if you look at the issues emanating from China, look, there's the traditional military threats. So like, do they invade Taiwan, and what do we do about that if they do? Or you know, do they you know try to start to establish you know, military bases and kind of push around other countries, undermine kind of international norms that we rely on? Uh, but then there's a technology space where you know the, you have the risk of you know the continued theft of say intellectual property from American companies, but you also have the risk of you know China exporting the kind of surveillance technologies that it uses at home and kind of you know, uh, in, infusing the world with the brand of kind of totalitarian technology that they use to spy on their own people, that that, that like an inkblot starts to spread around the world and that poses huge risks to democracy itself. You know? We should get a hold of that. Yeah, because you know, yeah, they're starting to export that stuff. So, I mean, <laughs> if you look at the Biden team, like this is a lot of what they, they've been focused on uh, is trying to get common approaches with Europe and, and allies in Asia about, hey, how are we thinking about this? How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to ensure that the technology and the, the digital infrastructure we rely on, you know, doesn't become penetrated or vulnerable to Chinese cyber attacks or Chinese surveillance and that kind of thing. So like this is, you know, this is going to be a big, big issue. But technology, you mentioned technology generally, I think, disinformation and social media is a foreign policy challenge. You know, the social media platforms that have wreaked so much havoc in uh, American democracy have done the same in lots of countries. And so in a strange way, yep. our capacity to, to rein in disinformation and potentially regulate social media, I think is, you know, is, it really is a foreign policy issue. I mean, Vladimir Putin has used that to great reward. Um, so, that, you know, if you look at technology and climate and democracy in China, I think that's kind of where this is headed. What about Section 230? You know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about, yeah. You know, essentially, for, you know, the, the, the internet was set up in a way in which these companies have no liability, that, that they're not responsible for what's on their platforms in any way, and certainly not in any way comparable to a media outlet like a newspaper. The problem is, like the majority of Americans get their news on social media, and it's totally unregulated. There's no liability for the companies. And the algorithms for companies like Facebook are written in a way to mainline sensationalism and, you know, therefore conspiracy theory. Keep people on. Yeah. And and they find that, uh, you know, agitating people keeps a lot of people on. Yeah. And, so. this, and this totally connects to where we began this conversation because the reality is, you know, we can't do things like build Afghanistan if our democracy is unraveling at home. You know, we can't lead the world uh, and offer an alternative to Chinese authoritarianism if our democracy is unraveling at home. And so we have to start thinking about these things as connected. You know, cleaning up our democracy is the best thing we can do for our foreign policy because we have to once again be able to show the world, hey, here's the best alternative. <laughs> Multiracial, multiethnic democracy can work. I don't know how that battle is going. We're seeing these laws being passed in these states yeah. that are really anti-democratic. I mean, literally, state legislatures being able to re reverse the result of an election. This is all very scary stuff. You're right. I mean, Facebook's whole algorithm is about keeping people on, and they feed them this stuff, so they know it's there. How does their algorithm feed this stuff without... Facebook understanding what's there and getting and getting rid of it. I don't understand that, but we got to write, start right. We got to do something about that one. Yeah, and again, it it, it ripples out um, around the world in in the sense that you know I uh, in Myanmar there was an ethnic cleansing in 2017 of you know the Rohingya population, yep. hundreds of thousands of people driven across their homes, and if you go there and you ask people. They'll tell you, look, like uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of hate campaigns online about the Rohingya. J you could not be a Facebook user in that country and not be kind of getting mainlined this uh, hatred against the Rohingya in a country that was only a few years into having an internet. You know, like they you know, set it up and Facebook became the dominant platform. And Facebook only had, uh, well, they had zero employees based in Myanmar. They just had an algorithm. Um, and, and so here's this American platform that 
can kind of create convulsions. And this is why this is also a foreign policy issue, you know, that a a lot of the challenges we've seen to democracy around the world, you know, particularly like look at Putin's use of disinformation, not just in the US, but in Europe, rely upon Section 230 in a way. You know, they rely upon the idea that, that Facebook or social media company is not in any way responsible for what's on its platform. And so I think in a post post 9-11 foreign policy, we have to think about, hey, what are the things that emanate from within the United States that are also rippling out around the world in a lot of ways that we wouldn't want them to? So there's a lot that should be on our plate, yeah. so to speak. And uh, I mean, this disinformation, if you talk, you talk about the pandemic and the disinformation is killing people, right? Because they're spreading this disinformation deliberately for ratings and, you know, money. Uh, and also that's what's going on online. Unbelievably pernicious, unbelievably immoral. Yeah. And if you approach it from, you know, someone who worked in national security uh, and politics, but is if you look at it from like, hey, the purpose of the, of government policy is to protect Americans and to save their lives. That you know, That's the basis under which we went in Afghanistan, right? Uh, and, and, and yeah, I think people would think you have to save people's lives from terrorism. But if you look at the, the threat to people's lives from pandemics, as we've just lived through, from extreme weather events caused by climate change, from gun violence, um, from disinformation that could lead someone to not get a life-saving vaccine, you know, if you were just if you if you were a management consultant that came down from outer space to look at how the U.S. government is structured and what it prioritizes, um, you know, you would think it was crazy that we spent seven trillion dollars uh, on a war on terrorism and these other much more lethal um, in many cases threats um, of guns, of extreme weather events, of pandemics and of, of the impact that disinformation can have in interacting with that, I think we need to kind of change our mindset about what we're, how we are protecting ourselves. I mean, the internet, there's a public safety issue with how unregulated social media platforms are. And when there was a public safety issue around cars not having seatbelts, the government said, you have to have seatbelts, right? And, and so to me, it's not about regulating to obviously, as the right would say, to favor one political movement over another. It's about regulating on behalf of public safety here uh, at this point. In, in, including saying people can't come to places if they're not vaccinated. You know, you have yeah. the freedom to not be vaccinated, but you also have the freedom to stay away from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the same, <laughs> same here. Yeah. So... Uh, Knowing folks in in the Biden administration, as you must, of course, how on board this reset that you're talking about, that we've been talking about, are they? I mean, he emphasized climate, certainly. Yeah. He's talked about uh, democracy. How are we aggressively turning to to this? I think that they understand this. I mean, these are people I know well and talked to about this for years. And in a lot of ways, you know, we didn't do as much as I would have liked in the Obama years. This is where we were trying to get in those later Obama years and we're focused on, on climate and Paris and pandemics. And well, we had a little problem with this Republican Congress. Too. Yeah. It's hard. Well, that's that, part of it. That, yeah, like that. people, it's, you know, I have to explain to people like we would have done a lot of the things that the Biden people are now trying to do if we could have, uh, when we didn't have Congress. But the, I think with the Biden team, they, they definitely get this fundamental reset. And there are a couple of things I'd highlight. And then a couple of worries I have, um, you know, on the positive side, they definitely get that. And Biden talks about this, like, hey, the biggest thing America can do for its role in the world is just get our act together here at home. And that informs everything from his, you know, build back better agenda um, to just, you know, making American democracy work better. Um, Climate is clearly a focal point for them. I I think a couple of things that concern me. One is on the democracy front, it's not just about your capacity to to build back better, as important as that is. It's is is our democracy safe. And, 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 and so the, the incapacity, and I can't blame Joe Biden for this because he doesn't you know, control Christian cinema and Joe Manchin's head, but the incapacity to prevent the kind of laws that you're talking about is a real vulnerability here because authoritarians have copycatted similar approaches in other countries. And we could be in a, a place where the next election is overturned in ways that could be devastating for democracy in America and around the world. 
so there's the, the blind spot at home is obviously the whether there's any way to prevent this continued kind of Republican authoritarian playbook from moving forward on things like voting and redistricting, et cetera. And then I think abroad, because there's kind of bipartisan support for a uh, tough on China policy, which is understandable to some extent, you know, that can lead to a lot of momentum behind kind of just the most rote hawkish approach, you know, we're mass amounts of new defense spending and kind of gearing up for the big Cold War against China. And, 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 and you've already seen how at home that can morph into stigmatization of, of Asian Americans. And, and so the, the, I think controlling this anti-China momentum is, is going to be a bit of a, of a challenge for them as well. On this tech front, I don't know, Al, it's an interesting question as to how much the the executive branch of government can do to try to compel more responsible behavior from social media. Ideally, Congress would, like you said, look at Section 230, but I, it's hard to see a bipartisan, you know, regulatory approach to social media. So I think that that does kind of. Lead I don't know. Of, I yeah. don't know. I think there is some bipartisanship on that, actually. I mean, some uh, on the right are going like, well, these social media, they've been banning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some right wing stuff. So it's it's kind of coming from the opposite place. Yeah, but yeah. there have been some Republicans talking about two thirty. So yeah, I mean, well, maybe maybe then you know then maybe there's an opening there for something because that to me is about as important a step we could as we could take. Ben, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a lot of information, and I think a really great conversation. And I hope you come back again. No, thanks you. And uh, it, may, it reminds me of a few times that uh, you, you know, we had you into the situation room, and you always ask, you know, you always ask hard questions, which is good. Um, so it, it took me back to those days. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.